o'clock, it is four o'clock. Well, actually, if it was three o'clock, we'd have two more hours, but next time. So, phase two of the passenger journey, we will now be looking at pre-departure arrival. And this particular session will focus on passenger data exchange, identification of travelers, and risk assessment. And to lead us into this part of the journey, I'm very happy to welcome back, as always, Vijay Punusami. Vijay is Director International and Public Affairs at the QI Group and President Hermes Air Transport Organization. So Vijay, always a pleasure. We're looking forward to a dynamic presentation to end the day. C'est bon? C'est bon. <laughs> Merci. Merci beaucoup, Denis. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Our air passenger numbers, as you've been hearing uh, since the beginning of this symposium, continue to grow and is expected to nearly double to 7.8 billion by 2036. Now, if you keep those numbers in mind, at the same time, recognize that the threats to security continue to grow, not only inherently, but also compounded by the fact that the passenger numbers are growing. Now, facilitation is obviously being impacted negatively by those two factors, the increasing number of air passengers and the increasing security threats. The challenge, of course, is also, as we embrace on promoting facilitation, is never to underestimate the importance of security as the priority. I think in our discussions throughout, we should recognize that notions of trying to balance security and facilitation or compromise should not be pursued. What we should pursue is the idea of enhanced security with the best possible facilitation. Now, obviously, with this double challenges of fast increasing passenger numbers and increasing security threats, to manage secure, safe, and seamless travel necessarily involves change. Not changing is not an option. As we change, obviously, technology offers an incredible opportunity for us to be able to meet those twin challenges of enhanced security and enhanced facilitation. But we'll also be mindful of the need to do this for all, not for some, but for all. Mindful of ICAO's mantra that no country will be left behind, I think probably technology offers those countries which are behind the opportunity to leapfrog into new technology and actually allow a common standard because uniformity remains a top priority when we talk about international aviation. To discuss these and, and other issues of interest when it comes to um, our subject matter today, we, we are delighted to have a very um, eminent group of uh, panelists, and, and I will introduce them uh, one by one as I call on them each to make their, what we agreed to be a, a no more than 12 minutes uh, presentation, uh, after which we'll have an interactive, because that's a key word also in terms of our processes going forward, how interactive they need to be, and I want the session also to be very interactive. 
Uh, first, I'd like to call upon uh, Théophile Nduna Leboussi, who is the uh, chef de cabinet de la Direction Générale Documentation et to uh, make his presentation. Please. Bonjour. Good afternoon. First of all, I'd like to make a clarification because in the documents that we received, they said Well, I'm not the director general, rather the head of the office of the director general. So I am pleased to be here today among you to share with you Gabon's experiences in the e-visa. Gabon is a country in Central Africa. Its official name is Gabonese Republic. The capital is Libreville, which is the administrative and political capital as well. The head of state is Ali Bongo Ondimba. The surface area is 267,667 square kilometers. And it has borders with Equatorial Guinea and Cameroon in the north. Congo is to the south and the east, and the Atlantic Ocean is in the west. The population is 1.98 million. This is according to the 2016 data from the World Bank. The official language is French, and the currency is the Central African franc, and it has a political system which is a multi-party presidential system. Gabon has nine provinces, 48 districts, and 52 municipalities. The migration situation in Gabon is such that Gabon is primarily a destination country and to a lesser extent a country of transit and origin. So these circumstances mean that the government has to have a public policy on migration. So that means that it has to have a vision and also the means to manage this phenomenon of international migration. So Gabon has a legal framework, which is based on Act 5 slash 86 from the 18th of June 1986. And this establishes the rules for foreigners to enter and stay in the Gabonese Republic. And it has been uh, adapted to the current situation. Also, there are um, texts from CMAC which have been incorporated in the national body of laws, and there are bilateral agreements on visa exemptions and ministerial circulars on exceptions for uh, entry to Gabon, which are granted to certain groups of countries. Gabon also has institutional support with dedicated entities that interact to handle this multi-dimensional thing, which is the international migration. The main responsibility is rests with the Ministry of the Interior, but then also the Ministry of the Defense does surveillance, and the Ministry, Ministry of Labor works on the framework and securing the workforce. Also, the Minister Ministry of Social Affairs, Affairs takes care of minors who are migrants and vulnerable migrants, and the Mi Ministry of Foreign Affairs works on refugee management. This migration policy is subject to regular assessments, and it aims to achieve smart aims, which are specific, measurable, accessible, relevant, and time-bound. <clears throat> The Directorate General for Documentation is the policy arm and the backbone of the planning and implementation of the migration policy. We have a National, National Police Forces Unit, and this is backed up by a, deg a decree number 0407, and it is under the administrative supervision of the Ministry of the Interior. 
the Directorate General, or the DGDI, offers the following services. They issue visas, as well as travel author authorization for entry and exit, for the extension of stays, for residence certificates, temporary res residence cards and refugee cards, the regular passport, the laissez-passes, and border controls and migratory flow management. If you would like to come to Gabon, people who are required to have visas according to their country of or origin, they can go to diplomatic missions or consular missions. And we are working t with the diplomatic missions to issue visas there. You can receive permission to end enter uh, granted by the DGDI, or you can also get a visa upon arrival at the international airport in Libreville. And then within the country, we also have branch offices which play this role. And in July 2015, we established the e-visa. In terms of security, so first we spoke about facilitation, and now to security. We have internal management of its of the files. Also, we work on border control to manage the migration flow, and we used MIND technology to have a connection to Interpol through the I-24-7. Thus, the e-visa is the platform used to request entry visas. In order to meet the new international requirements for facilitation, while taking into consideration security, uh, Gabon has the e-visa. The e now, I have a video uh, that I wanted to show, but I can't. It highlighted the advantages of the e-visa. We see that there is no more need to go to the missions. There are uh, less expenses also. Uh, the procedures are easier, they're simplified, and they take less time. When this e-visa was established, we had certain difficulties, namely the adaptation of the infrastructure to the new requirements. And we saw that there was a, a, a lack of communication channels between the applicants and the e-visa team. Also, there was an inflexibility in uh, request modifications, because any requests that had an error were systematically re re rejected. And so now, however, th we can make changes, and the uh, communication between the team and the applicants is much better. To request a visa, there are four stages. The first step is to select the type of visa desired. There are two types. There's the simple visa, which is for three, uh, single entry for three months. And there's the multiple entry for six months. The second stage is to correctly fill out the formula. The third step is to attach documentation with a color photography and a copy of the passport. And a passport should have six months of validity. And you send this in, and then you will receive a c confirmation of receipt, which, is, uh, which you can see here on this slide. As regards the procedure, it takes 72 hours, because that's the time that it will take us to consult our our files, and then if validated, then you will receive the authorization, and this will allow you to come to Gabon with your entry visa. We have some, you have some statistics in front of you. These summarize the data from the launch 
in September, we have had approximately 71,000 visas. There are various types here that you see, and the group, the age group that requests the most visas is the group 3249, which is approximately 40,000 visa. And the countries that request them the most are uh, France, China, and India. When you s look at the reasons why people request visas, we have uh, business, uh, professionals, approximately 13,000, and family visits, up, uh, around 10,000. In conclusion, I would say three years after this was launched and with the improvements that were made, now the e-visa e is a tool that is fast and secure, and it makes Gabon into an attractive and competitive destination. Therefore, it contributes to the diversification of resources for growth and for sustainable development. And this is what the Gabon, Gabon authorities require. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Théophile. You were uh, actually quite quick. You have one uh, m minute uh, extra, and so you also were quick in your information provided. Uh, also, I'd like you to note y your questions or comments that you would like to make in the question and answer phase, either live or to send them by email so that we receive them up here. To our second panelist, uh, Dianta Rogers, who is from the Ministry of Infrastructure and Environment, Director General for Transport and Aviation Unit at the Aviation Safety and Security of Netherlands. Dianta, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Fiji, for the kind introduction. In my presentation, I would like to tell you something about challenges for travelers, border authorities, and also for airlines in relation to the transfer of API. Okay, you can switch to the um, to channel 11. I will continue my presentation in Dutch. Let's see who's listening. Now, I heard I had to make a joke in the former panel, but that was all I could, uh, could think of. Uh, let me start by saying that the amount of multiple passports is increasing. Uh, multiple nationalities, increased globalization, international marriages, migration followed by naturalization, and also the differences in basic nationality and citizenship regulations based on place of birth of a, ch of a child, the just solely based on the soil, if you may say, or the nationality of one of both parents, just sanguinis based on the blood. Now, if you have um, a child that has a German and a Filipinian uh, combination a father, and you have a Canadian and French uh, mother who have a child in the USA, you may have five national nationalities and el eligible for that. Uh, you also have a lot of multiple passports within, within one nationality, and you have a diplomatic passport, you have another one, you may have an UN or EU laissez-passer Interpol passport. You can even have two national passports because you will need to give one in to get an old-fashioned visa and in the same time you need to travel. So there are a lot of multiple passports out there which would not be a problem but how do they affect border innovations and the advanced passenger information. Okay, just a very quick background. Uh, some people, of course, uh, some uh, countries give expedited entry and exit always based on the nationality. Your elegi el uh, eligibility is based on the nationality. There are differences in processing, the vetting, uh, the amount of checks they want you to have, and also, of course, in corresponding baiting times. Now, if you have multiple passports, you would choose, of course, the shortest line, the quickest entry. And some countries, 
allow their citizens only to travel in and out with their own passport, even when they have multiple passports. Now, if you have two countries who both have that regulation, how do you travel? You would have multiple passports on that journey. Um, with the innovation of the automated border processes, we have a standard on API. Uh, Monsieur Le Foyer said in his opening statements, you have a standard on API, and the pre-vetting is done on the API. Uh, you have an increase in electronic travel authorization system, automated border processes instead of manual desk, because governments want to reduce the cost of their uh, border forces. Let's, let's uh, do it uh, quick, but still uh, secure. Electronic visas, my colleague from Gabon just explained uh, the visas instead of in the passport, electronic visas. And we see a move to entry and exit systems. But what happens if you have multiple passports? And what happens if the airline's responsibilities in Annex 9 stay the same? Because an airline has to check the passport, he has to send the machine a readable zone as API, and they also have to check for the visas. Now, there's quite a challenge if you have an electronic visa. How do you check the validity, especially when you have, for example, only one entry and the e-visa has a validity date, but you want to travel twice in that? Okay, an airline will have a quite high fines if the API has discrepancies. The distribution of the API is, of course, based on the machine-readable zone that, the, uh, that is presented at check-in or at boarding at the latest when you don't have check-in baggage. Uh, the passport data are checked at automated border control systems, but they will not always align with the check-in machine-readable zone when other passports are used. Uh, not corresponding international legislation of standards uh, is um, with 9303 and with the API requirements, and I'll explain that API requirements around the world ask for a first name and a surname. Now, 9303, of course, allows for people with mononames. Uh, if you have a mononame and you want to have that sent as API, an airline cannot send that because the API systems will ask for a first name and a, a surname. Now, within uh, DOC 9303, you have allowances for people with only one name. Mononames are, are very common in, in parts of India, especially in the south, in Indonesia, in Java, uh, Tibet, Myanmar, Mongolia, and most Africans only have, um, have no surname. And it differs per country where people put it in the identifier. Now, the 9303 people, and, and I see quite a few here in the room might say, well, that's easy because you always have to put it in the first uh, identifier if you only have one name. Uh, and, but then you still don't have a second identifier which is uh, requested for the API. Now, um, DOC 9303, like I said, does ask if you only have a mono name that you place it into the first identifier, yet a very large country in the, in the world places it in the second, and why? Because in 9303, it lists the possibilities of names that can be uh, sent for a first identifier. That is family name, surname, but they're not naming patronames as a possible first identifier. So that's something that can be added to the work load of Tom Kinnegan for adaption of 9303, because if that is happening, then uh, India will probably uh, be able to have, according to their interpretation, um, patronames also as a first identifier. But still, it does not give a name, a second name, that is requested for API. So you see parts of governments not working together to have the same ID, what is possible with uh, passenger data and what is possible with passport data. Uh, the airlines have found a solution, and what they do is either FNU, first name unknown, or last name unknown. Uh, and that is accepted, but not by all countries. And sometimes, if you have an electronic visa, and the country that issues the electronic visa uh, can have a different interpretation to, to have that, that mono name as a first or second identifier. If you then send it, then the API will not match. Again, challenges. Um, 
These are the same one, not adjusting to 9303, differences in the machine readable zone, sometimes also in the visual zone, sometimes also are uh, fed back to the airlines for um, discrepancies. And uh, the allowances that I just explained in 9303, but that's not, is adapted in the API regulations. Also, there are no standards for uh, electronic visas and what I find a real challenge is how do you check the validity for airlines? Now, I've heard colleagues, national uh, colleagues saying, well, they can just check it on the internet, the name and, and the number, and then they just see if that person has an e-visa. Well, I would like to uh, ask any of you how you're going to manage that if you have a 450 passengers on a flight and you have to check manually the validity of the data, but still there is no um, the, air, the countries that, for example, would have an e-visa without having an interactive API, they should, they should, I'm just saying uh, that it's not in, in uh, Annex 9, but I think they should uh, be lenient towards API discrepancies from the airlines because they cannot check it in real time. Okay, so the, the aircraft operators may be held responsible for these API discrepancies and if you think, well, that's not a big challenge, well, it is because fines can go from one to 10,000 per passenger and that is quite a lot in a competitive business. Um, and they may have uh, uh, discrepancies even when they performed a document check. Uh, passengers can be seen of, uh, as overstayers when you have a um, entry exit system and they came in with one pass passport but went out with the other passport. Uh, they may be, may be sent back. Airlines have to bring them back in that case if they are inadmissible. And the technical challenges of the departure control system that cannot use um, more than one uh, passenger identification. The challenges for states. Well, the API vetting is performed on another travel document. So you will have to do another vetting and maybe it's another result, so that's a challenge. Uh, many API and border control systems do not have the capability to mix, to match um, multiple API data sets. Again, a challenge. Some uh, systems have it, but only on a case-by-case -case basis and not on a uh, general status. Then we have the states using the API data for entry and exit. They will have different uh, they have some people coming in never leaving, so they'll be seen as overstayers, or they have people um, leaving and never returning. Uh, mismatches always require manual uh, intervention, and as states, we're trying to lessen the border force and to have a very efficient border force, so that goes against that. Consequence for travelers, delays, and this is quite an international crowd. I'm sure there are a lot of people here with multiple passports, diplomatic passports, etc. You may not be aware that airlines have gotten a possible fine or a strike against an MOU because you traveled with multiple passports. But also you may be asked to check again and again because they want to see if it is, uh, it is right. And possible refusals to travel again. Now in the panel, last um, ICAO facilitation panel last September. We had discussions on these items and um, the Netherlands proposed a recommended practice on that a, a entry and exit systems should be able to reconcile multiple travel passports to one passenger. Also a new standard was adopted. You shall not penalize or hold an aircraft operator responsible if they travel with two valid passports. And how do you avoid problems. I have 38 seconds left, so I'll try to do it as quick and dirty as I can. You have to follow 9303, check its accordance in practice, uh, but also uh, DOC 9303, in my opinion, could use some uh, explanation on um, patronames, could use uh, a new work item on electronic visas, uh, standardization of that and I think our moderator also mentioned harmonization uh, as an important issue and I think that's, this is one of the items that should be looked at. I've got three seconds. Oh, uh, I will have one minute over time, that's all. Um, there should be um, standards for electronic visas uh, and the practical possibilities to check electronic visas or delay, delete or change the respons uh, responsibility for airlines. Now, manufacturers that are 
uh, helping states to give electronic visas should also be aware of this item. How are other states or airlines, how can they check the e-visas? It's not just that you produce an e-visa, yay, you know, they don't have to go to the embassy, which is all good, but how are the other responsibilities of airlines satisfied in that case? Uh, we should, as API data for border control, should match m m multiple passports and the entry and exit systems, not for the airlines, but for the border authorities themselves. You can save money and resources if you do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dianta. Now, please welcome uh, Simon Denyan who is Program Manager, Travel Document Security, Transnational Threats Department at the Organization for Security and Cooperation Europe. Simon, the floor is yours. So it's late in the day, so let's start with a quick audience survey. I want to see a show of hands here, okay? So, who here is a representative from a country. See a show of hands? Okay, good. I have two more questions. Who here is from a country that already has a fully functioning API system? Less hands. And who here is from a country that does not yet have an API system or is in the process of setting one up? Okay, good. Thanks for participating in the survey. Always good to get to know the audience. So some of you may have seen my speech yesterday. I have good news and I have bad news. The bad news is I have no more pictures of my beautiful baby girl, Cara. Sorry for that. The good news is I do have another story about her. I'm going to try and fit it into the agenda also. So before Cara was born, my wife insisted that we not find out the sex of the baby. So we didn't know if it was a boy or a girl. I was dying to know. I really wanted to know. I could have painted the, the room pink. I would have borrowed less clothes from my family, all of whom seem to have had baby boys. I also would have saved the bother of arguing with my wife over boys' names, or telling my dad that I was going to name the child after him. So you see that finding out information in advance of a new arrival can be very, very useful. Oh, you see what I've done there? This is even more useful in border security and especially in aviation security. I've gone full circle. This why API is now mandatory. It's mandatory by the UN Security Council and also by ICAO. We heard from Dianta about some of the discrepancies and problems related to API. I want to go back to basics. I want to talk about the what, the why, and the how. What is API? Why is it beneficial? And how can states establish a national API system. So let's start with the what. What is API? Now, I could have done a PowerPoint presentation, but instead I'm going to use my colleagues up here on stage to help me with a small demonstration. So, Mahmoud over here, he's from Libya, but he tells me his favorite airline is Lufthansa. Vijay here is from Mauritius, and these are his team from the targeting center in Mauritius. I don't actually know if you have one or not, but however. So I'm now checking on to a flight, Lufthansa to Mauritius. So I come into the, air, into the airport, beep, 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 scan my passport. Lufthansa now has my passport details. If Mauritius have an API system, I don't know if you do, but if you do, you will then get my passport details and flight information in advance. But on its own, of course, this is just 
data. If you don't do anything with the data, it's useless. So VJ needs to hand this on, he already has done that, handed it on to his targeting center, his analysis team here. And it's going through them all, I can see. And they can use it to check it against watch lists, databases, risk profiles. So that is a basic summary of what is API. Now, why is it beneficial? Well, how many of you have heard the story of Mehdi Namouche? Not too many hands, or maybe you're getting shy, in case I ask you a question. Mehdi Namouche was a French citizen who, in 2014, traveled to fight in Syria. French counterterrorism officials placed him on a national watch list, also a European watch list, and then even an international terrorist database. Despite this, Mehdi managed to travel back to Europe using broken travel via Asia. He did this using his own passport information. Once he got back to Europe, he traveled to Brussels, went to the Jewish Museum with a Kalashnikov rifle, and killed four people in less than a minute. If Mehdi Namouche's API data had been systematically checked against these watch lists and databases, it's highly unlikely he would have been able to carry out this attack. So the first thing that VJ and his team can do when they receive my information is check it against watch lists and databases. See if I'm on any of these watch lists and databases. These are the known suspects. The other thing they can do is check me against any risk profiles that their country has established. Maybe an Irish male traveling alone with very little luggage for a short stay in Mauritius is quite suspicious. That would get a hit against the targeting center. So put simply, API, you can use API data to screen for known people and known risks, as well as unknown people and known risks. So that's the what and the why. Let's look at the how. How can you establish an API system? Well, we heard from Ulrich yesterday that only a third of UN member states have an API system. Why is this? Well, we in the OSC, we do capacity building, and some of the issues that we faced, I would say there's the top three. Firstly, legislation. Secondly, technical complexity. And thirdly, money. So let's look at all three. Legislation. Put simply, if you do not have legislation in place that insists that the airlines give you this data, they just won't give it to you. Why not? Well, firstly, it costs them money. But also, it'll be contrary to data privacy rules in their host country. So you'll need to put in place an API law. Now this can be short and simple, but it needs to have five key questions answered. What data do you want? Why do you want it? When do you want it? Who will use the data? And how long will you keep it for? We in the OSC help states to draft this legislation. We've been doing so for a number of states in the OSC region so far, and we can offer this to you also. We can also give you the legislation from other countries, and you can compare and contrast it, or just copy and paste it if you like. So that's obstacle number one. Obstacle number two is technical complexity. There are a huge amount of companies in the API marketplace. Some of them will deal with just the connection with the airlines. Others will do the analysis. Others will do the whole rigmarole. Well, then there's also others who are more interested in selling you the best product, the most expensive product, regardless of whether you need it or not. We in the OSC 
help countries to do an assessment of what are their needs. We helped them to run a RFP, a request for proposal, with the various companies to see what the companies have to offer and compare it, what are the needs, and then make an independent recommendation based on the best product for the best cost. That brings me to obstacle number three, cost. Money, money, money. Must be funny in a rich man's world. These systems do cost money. Money to establish, to operate, and to maintain. The connection to the airlines, that's the cheap part. All you need is a server. Might cost between 20,000 and 50,000, depending on how much data is going through it. The expensive part is this part, the analysis team. But the good news is, you can get this for free. There's three ways that I know of to get this for free. And all of them are here in this room. The United States Customs and Border Protection have a free API and PNR analysis system. It's called ATSG, Automated Targeting System Global. They offer it for free to states in exchange for a, a data exchange memorandum. They also give you free support and free maintenance. The US are sitting right over there. Second way I know is through the UN. The UN, Ulrich is sitting up here at the front, got a, a system called the TRIP system from the Netherlands. They also offer this for free to states. Another way is through the World Customs Organization. They have a scaled down version of the US system, but they also offer it to states for free. And I believe Terry Wall is speaking on a panel tomorrow. We in the OSC can help facilitate contacts with all, of these con with all of these agencies to help you get your analysis system for free. So the cost is no longer a burden. In summary, I've spoken about what is API, why it's beneficial, and how to overcome the legislative, technical, and financial barriers. My business cards are here on the table. I would like to exchange as many of them with you as possible. And maybe to finish up, I would like to say I'm happy, to, happy that the organizers have invited me here and that I'm happy to answer any of your questions about API, about the OSC, or perhaps if you have any suggestions or tips on how to raise a two-month-old daughter. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. You've collected your passport. Yes, good. <laughs> Thank you very much. And now, last but not least, we have uh, Eric Stabinas who is the Identity Management and Biometrics Officer at the International Organization for Migration. Please, again, reminder, note your questions if you want to shoot them in email, or we'll come back to you shortly. Eric. Uh, thank you very much for your kind invitation. I realize that I am the only thing standing between you and the reception later tonight, so I shall be short and sweet and stick to the point. Uh, for, first of all, thank you very much to ICAO for inviting IOM to this important event. It is a great pleasure to be here. Uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 technical assistance for API implementation has been high on the symposium's agenda and we will be spending quite a bit of time talking about it tomorrow. Um, I would like to share with you some experiences and thoughts that we have generated uh, during the last few years in, in providing technical assistance to our member states uh, in the area of uh, passenger data implementation. Uh, for, those, uh, for those of you who may be new to the International Organization for Migration, IOM, we are the United Nations Migration Agency, 
Um, IOM is probably the most projectized international organization that I know. Uh, absolute majority of work that we do uh, is structured as donor-funded projects. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, a typical annual project pro pro portfolio that, that uh, IUM handles is about $1.6 billion. And in order to deliver all those projects worldwide, we have considerable presence there, uh, uh, IUM missions in 150 member states, total about 400 field offices. Uh, as well as 11,000 uh, 11, uh, 11, uh, IUM staff worldwide. IUM has been providing technical assistance uh, to its member states related to border management and some extent identity management for perhaps about 50 years. Technical assistance in passenger data implementation has been a relatively new, new area, uh, and demand for passenger data assistance, first of all API, has surged dramatically during the last, uh, du during the last uh, 12 months. Uh, the technical assistance work that uh, we do related to traveler identification management, we have aligned it closely with the uh, uh, ICAO uh, trip strategy. A couple of years ago, IOM and ICAO have concluded an MOU uh, for, for consolidating and expanding uh, cooperation. And uh, one of the focus areas in the MOU is to work together on developing and implementing technical assistance projects for helping member states to, to realize, to implement the ICAO TRIP strategy. Um, in order to structure this work, this assistance, we have developed an IOM action plan for ICAO TRIP implementation assistance for this uh, triennium which has been closely coordinated with our partners, the ICAO Secretariat, Working Group, etc., etc. And this is the roadmap, so to speak, that guides us internally uh, within IOM uh, in, providing mission, uh, in providing technical assistance related to uh, traveler identification capacity building. A major focus area in the uh, action plan is uh, providing assistance in passenger data and first of all API. Just to give you a quick overview of our current projects related to passenger data, there is a major uh, regional project in Western Balkans uh, 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 covering five, uh, uh, five countries there, as well as national projects in Ukraine, Georgia, Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan. And we have been um, having discussions with uh, government authorities in perhaps another uh, couple of dozen states around the world exploring uh, opportunities for, for providing technical assistance related to passenger data. The current project portfolio here has been funded by two donors, that is the European Union and IDF, which stands for the IOM Development Fund, uh, an IOM internal donor facility that, uh, for, uh, that uh, provides funding to, uh, to innovative projects in priority areas such as uh, API implementation. Obviously, in this, this, this kind of assistance, partnerships and close coordination, uh, coordination matters a lot. Uh, we have been enjoying a, a, a confident and very close partnership with OSCE. As you can see, most of those projects are in the OSCE region. And, uh, and actually, that goes beyond coordinating activities. We, we actually have co-funded and tailor-made some of the activities. And I think the, these are, uh, this is a shining example how two international organizations can work together uh, for the benefit of their member states. In addition to that, we, we have a clo close and trusted uh, working partnerships with Frontex and the ICAO Secretariat, as well as the ICAO ICBWG, 
implementation and capacity building working group who in particular have been developing some guidance material on API implementation. But let's have a quick look what providing technical assistance in passenger data implementation looks in practice. There are quite a few areas, but to put it simply, it boils down to three broad areas. The first one is helping, helping states, helping government authorities to understand what API and PNR is all about. Passenger data is a complex business and it requires the knowledge of the regulatory framework, technology, the legal dimension, uh, procurement tender management, privacy and uh, data protection, etc., etc. And it is important that in every country uh, the, 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 the uh, government agencies have, have enough staff knowledgeable about all those things before they start implementing a passenger data system and using it. The second area is probably even more important and that is uh, helping states to implement an API system. And that is basically a procurement tender that, that would result in, in, in the member state having a, 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 an API system ready to use in, in, in practice. Um, at the moment, actually, there, are, the, um, there is not much tec impartial technical advice available in this area from international organizations, and member states very often go straight to vendors, the commercial community, uh, um, and vendors uh, obviously can offer high quality projects and solutions, however, they cannot uh, offer impartial solution and, uh, and uh, there, is, there is a considerable need for, for, uh, for international organizations to play the role of an honest, honest broker, if you wish, to help states to articulate their needs and make sure that, that when they go for procurement, they get the right thing at a good value. And the third main area is exploiting passenger data. And this is something that up to recently used to be forgotten. And indeed, the global debate on passenger data implementation has been on implementing a passenger data in practice. And following this narrative, it would seem that once you have a passenger data system where the data travels from the airline to the border authority, the job is done and there is nothing else to do and life is just beautiful. In fact, the real work is just starting. And indeed, uh, let's face it, passenger data is utterly useless on its own unless it is used against some, against some uh, tactical intelligence project, pro product such as watch lists or is analyzed and turned into, into some intelligence that could be used for risk-based border controls that can increase both uh, border security and border facilitations. There are a few other uh, areas that uh, API, PNR, technical assistance projects provide, such as developing an implementation plan or doing a legislative review and developing national API or PNR legislation, uh, creating a national API working group and engaging stakeholders, uh, doing assessments in a number of areas. These are all important, but basically I think they are subsets of those three broad areas that, that I have just, uh, just, uh, just gone through. And finally, I would like to, to, to share with you some, some challenges or, or perhaps as well as lessons learned that we have encountered during the last year or two in, uh, in implementing assistance projects related to passenger data. Uh, a considerable challenge is misconceptions about API and PNR. Well, obviously, one, one challenge is uh, having no knowledge about API and PNR. But that's no big drama. Many people are quick learners and with a few workshops and, and training courses they, they pick it up easily what API and PNR is all about. A real trouble is when people 
know a little bit about API and PNR and have misconceptions and they got it wrong and uh, and uh, to get the correct understanding takes a bit of effort. Uh, if uh, technical consultations or workshops or, 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 or seminars take at an early, uh, early phase of API implementations, those misconceptions can be easily corrected. However, in some cases, those mis misconceptions have crept into uh, developing national API uh, or, or PNR legislation or a national implementation plan, and then it takes quite a bit of time and effort to, to rectify those things. Yet another challenge that, that has been popping up is uh, interagency cooperation, such uh, issues such as uh, the government designating a lead agency for implementing a national uh, passenger data system and ensuring that the single window uh, principle is followed. Uh, um, that's the ideal, but, but in, 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 in many cases, uh, the uh, level of interagency cooperation is not close enough and and uh, and it is not so easy to come with uh, with uh, with a clear whole of government perspective uh, how to go ahead with implementing an API system. Sustainability is another issue, uh, first of all, because passenger data systems require, require data services, which means uh, recurrent uh, maintenance fees. This is not a problem of, 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 of on its own. However, uh, it is a bit of a challenge when it comes to providing technical assistance uh, uh, as part of international aid. For API and PNR systems, it is not possible just to supply the government with a system because uh, it is important that it, it that the government has capacity to cover uh, financial obligations to make sure that uh, the data services are provided on a sustainable uh, basis yet another area challenge or, or rather an important area is privacy and data protection that keeps popping up in all passenger data uh, projects There's is a vital area in getting it right. Obviously, those things are addressed in developing national API and PNR legislation. However, it is not just legislation, it is also uh, stakeholder management, making sure that privacy stakeholders are included in, in, into the implementation uh, from, the, from, the, from the very beginning. Yet another important item is the importance of needs assessment. And uh, I would argue it is the foundation of every successful API and PNR, uh, PNR um, implementation system. It happens in some countries when, uh, um, uh, when governments use data services is that they happen to get locked in and find it very difficult to change the service provider should a need arise. So yet another important lesson we have come around across is that it is important to have an exit strategy when running an API or PNR uh, procurement tender. Managing change might sound a major, a minor, minor detail. However, uh, however, it, it it has been important. Um, Implementing a passenger data project inevitably, inevitably brings change and uh, uh, most people are uncomfortable with change because uh, because it can compromise their position or, or position or, or power or their interest and it gen it naturally generates anxiety so it is indeed important to uh, to to have uh, a change management strategy and to re to reassure all those stakeholders that their interests will not be compromised yet another important area is is establishing and maintaining 
a solid contact with with uh, with carriers with the airlines this is not a nice thing to have this is a must must to have and uh, it requires dedicated staff as well as dedicated communications channels uh, to to uh, to communicate with with airlines Perhaps one of the major um, challenges uh, um, that, that I would highlight is the fact that the implementation of API and PNR systems uh, remains uh, primarily vendor-driven. And there is ongoing need for impartial technical advice, so that uh, the, which could, would come from international or regional organizations. Vendors have capacity to produce high quality products and services and they have capacity to, 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 to provide high quality technical expertise. However, there is one thing they cannot provide. They cannot provide impartial advice. They cannot provide disinterested advice because they have commercial interests. And indeed, there is a big role, I think, for, for international organizations to, to be an, an honest broker, if you wish, to help all those states to articulate their needs and to make sure that they procure what they really need at a good value. I am coming, coming uh, very close to the end of the list and uh, just a couple of other challenges that may be worth mentioning is uh, interoperability and data quality. Uh, interoperability, well obviously uh, uh, UN edifact uh, uh, specification exists and, and standard uh, message formats. However, the reality is different. There is a diversity of, of technical formats of messages that, that still cause, causes quite uh, Quite, uh, quite a bit of, 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 of um, confusion and technical, technical difficulties. And finally, but never, nevertheless, very, very importantly, there is still, still a gap, still need for dedicated guidance material on API, PNR implementation and practice. Obviously, some regulatory framework exists and it is, it is solid and relevant, such as ICAO standards and recommended practices or um, ICAO uh, WCO IATA technical guidelines for API PNR. However, there is hardly anything that would help member states to guide them and plan the practical implementation of the tender implementing the system. And it is encouraging that, that uh, IKEA or uh, Implementation and Capacity Building Working Group has uh, started developing those guidance materials and uh, um, the sooner they are av available, the better. I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. And once again, special thanks for uh, IKEA for bringing us here to to discuss better ways of, of mobilizing technical assistance uh, to our member states for passenger data applications. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Thank you very much, Thank you very much um, Eric. So ladies and gentlemen, you, you had four excellent presentations, a lot of commonalities, I would say, between the first two presentations uh, when it comes to the interaction between states and, and operators. Uh, please uh, let me know, just raise your hands if you have a, a question. I've already got a couple of questions which have come through on the, uh, on the iPad. Uh, any, anyone wishes to, I'll actually put through because a couple of questions uh, which came through the iPad are related to uh, actually uh, Theophil's presentation on, on e-visas. So the question that I would like to ask is the airlines have a responsibility before they accept the passenger to verify that the passenger has all of the documents necessary for the destination. Is that the case? So with the electronic visa, in the case of, of Gabon, for example, the establishment of this system, I imagine, 
is done in coordination with the operators also. And I come back to what uh, Eric just uh, spoke about with the contact with the airlines being necessary. So has this contact been established to reassure the airlines about the way that the e-visa is read before the passenger boards? And so by reassuring the airlines, can they ensure that the available information is correct? And at the same time, what is the responsibility of the airline vis-a-vis uh, -vis an incorrect reading of this e-visa? Théophile, please. Merci. Thank you. de ma présentation tout à l'heure je disais que euh, une non. fois que le visé est validé c'est allumé ouais. on va peut-être valider le micro avant we are going to check the microphone first authenticated here we go during my presentation I said that once the e-visa is validated, the person receives by email a document which is an entry, uh, permission for entry to Gabon. And so then you can go to your flight, go to Libreville, for example, and then get a visa when you arrive. So the problem is that when you request your visa, you indicate the date of arrival and the date of exit. And so sometimes people take the plane and they arrive in Gabon before the start of validity of their trip. And so this is a problem. So for example, someone could be not admitted to the country because of this, and then this comes back, the responsibility comes back to the airline. And so, does the airline have a way to deal with this? Yes, if there's doubt, well, once the, the visa tourniquet has been established, we have an exchange with the airlines, and we explain to them all of the procedures. And in a case of doubt, the airlines will go to the immigration services to ensure that they have the correct information. Merci. Thank you. Um, well, I may be a little bit of a rebel since I am representing a government, but I have specific thoughts about what a government should do. Um, and the rebel part is that I think if you are changing uh, your procedures without giving an airline or another party in the logistic chain a possibility to have a practical way of checking and doing their responsibilities, then you can do Two things, in this case, when you have electronic visas. One, you can have an interactive API system that allows an airline to know at check-in whether they can board the passenger or not, for example, with the ETA or ESTA systems. That's one, or with the Australian system. The second thing is what you could do is say, okay, they need to check the paper version for the date. If they don't do that, then they are responsible because they didn't check the paper um, version. And if they, they can also say if the passenger does not have the paper version, you cannot board them. Or you can say, well, if they have a paper version, um, just board them. And if that paper version is false, or they already have once entered on that, on that uh, visa, they're not allowed a second time, the airline cannot know, I will not hold them responsible. That is another option, and I think what a lot of, and I'm not saying Gabon is doing that, but I, I know of some countries that are saying, okay, we have an electronic visa, you can print it, but it's not even like a, a barcode or something that you can check, and they just say, well, airline, if it's not uh, valid, you are responsible if you have a uh, valid paper within the validity date, 
but you're only allowed one entry and they already used it, they still get a fine, they still get the responsibility, have to take them back, not only a fine, but also pay for the inadmissible cost. Now, I think as a government, you have to take that into thought before you do... Um, before you take those regulations. And since Annex 9 responsibilities still place that burden on the airline, you also have to think when you, when you do innovations, how can they practically deal with that? Yeah. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Uh, it's obviously a, a very important point when it comes to, I suppose, traveling. We, we all, I'm sorry, I believe on that, that it, a no visa regime is the best one, but as an alternative, an e-visa is better than a, a physical visa. But we must also be cognizant of the practical difficulties which may arise from that, which uh, puts an unfair burden on the operators, which perhaps uh, ICAO could certainly be looking at in terms of the Annex 9 uh, implementation to ensure that it's a fair and effective way of actually promoting uh, e-visas. Well, specifications Please. and guidelines on electronic visas would be a first step that I think ICAO might look into. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Any other, other questions? I mean, these were obviously some very good thoughts, and um, a question was also about ICAO standards on uh, e-visas. Uh, please, gentlemen from Nepal. This, yeah, you're on. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express my sincere thanks and appreciation to the um, eminent panelists for their very, very enlightening, enlightening presentations. My question is to Ms. Diantha. Um, I agree with uh, what Diantha said about the multiple passports issued in the name of same individual. There are many countries whose authorities are issuing multiple passports as per prevailing rules. For example, ordinary passports for private visits and official or diplomatic passports for official uh, visits. Uh, that is the same case in our country also. But my concern is how do you synchronize the data through API PNR if the two uh, passports issued to one individual are of same category and are valid? It may be con convenient in part of the, t of the holder, but a difficult task for the immigration and airlines uh, officials. I request for your reply with valid solution to this problem. Another is, uh, um, you mentioned about mononyms uh, mentioned, uh, in, in the passport. In, we are also facing the same problem. Uh, sometimes our customers approach the department and uh, often uh, raise, the issue, raise the issue of mononyms mentioned in their citizenship certificates, and we cannot answer them properly. So we ask them to place, um, uh, go to the district administration office and place the surname or family name there in, 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 uh, instead of mononym only. But it is a difficult task to change the uh, given name or name in the citizenship certificate itself. So um, how can we solve the problem? And another question, and I'm really appreciative of what uh, Mr. Simon uh, said in his presentation. He said that OSCE is uh, providing API PNR model laws to interested member states or any other countries who are interested to Im implement API PNR. Do you really provide such model laws these are the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Yanta. Uh, I think you asked me two questions, one about the mononames and one about two valid passports. Um, in my presentation, I said something about if you have two valid passports, then um, border authorities should be able to link the two passports to one another. So there should be common... Um, uh, the common search criteria for those two passports and they should be able to link them either on a case by case basis but even better if it is a, uh, if they are able to batch multiple passports when they're sent um, in total the second uh, question you had about the mononames well doc 9303 does allow for mononames and i would be very hesitant from an from a government 
airline or ICAO point of view to change that cultural custom. If people have a mono name, uh, then that is what it is. And we also allow it. What I find strange, if you do allow mono names for cultural reasons and in DOC 9303, at the same time you make regulations that do not allow a mono name. If you look in the API guidelines, you have to have a first name and a second name. I, I would find it very difficult to say that then you would duplicate the names because if my name is Vijay, my name is not Vijay Vijay. And if you put them in both um, the first name and the surname, if you duplicate them, your name changes. So I would find that solution difficult. But th what the airlines doing at the moment is either provide when they are sending API Vijay, but then they have, for example, first name unknown, FNU or LNU, last name unknown. But again, there are no specifications for that. I think if that is the common practice, that would be practical. And if you also have the same uh, standards when you uh, issue an electronic or a normal visa for that person with a mono name, and now you will have um, people with mono, name, mono names, and it's different in the passport than in the visa. Uh, because the one country uh, says, oh, if it's a mono name, I'll do it in the first identifier. And the other one says, no, it's a petroname. I cannot use it as the first identifier. I'll put it in the second. So I think standardization, harmonization, your comments, um, Mr. Moderator, were very, uh, um, very good in the beginning. You need um, standardization and harmonization also on these items. Thank you. Thank you very much. Simon, do you want to come back on? So the question was, do we really provide such laws? I mean, short answer is yes. And we have a, a database, actually, of all of these laws that we provide access to for all OSC <coughs> participating states. They can search up the different laws. There's also the technical implementation guides. We, if you take my business card, I'm sure I can give you uh, any number of laws that you, that you like. I mean, a lot of these are actually available in open source. If you Google, Denmark API law, you'll get a very nice API law there that you can use. So, short answer, yes. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, actually, we, we, are, we are now literally uh, out of time, and, and I'd literally like to thank you for your uh, interest and, and comments and questions uh, through here. And uh, before I offer you some, some thoughts uh, by way of conclusion, uh, I would like you really to, to, to thank uh, Teofil Dianta, Eric, and Simon for their uh, insights and, and sharing of their knowledge with all of us today and, and, and really give them a round of applause. <laughs> also, obviously, I'd like to thank all those who have put this wonderful program together, the, the Air Transport Bureau team, ICAO, the interpreters for allowing us to, to be able to uh, understand each other in this rather complex uh, this discussion. Uh, but by way of conclusion, um, allow me to offer a few thoughts that, in a way, if you go back to the ICAO mantra, and I, and I honestly believe in this, uh, no country is being left behind, but I think to ensure that no country is left behind as we promote a safe, secure, and seamless air travel, ICAO should promote effectively Uniformity, harmonization, interoperability, and coordination, both between and within states. ICAO should definitely do some work on developing uh, SAPs on e-visas. Airlines need to have access to interactive API systems, and governments should be able to match API data with travel authorization data. Governments should also share passenger data with all relevant national agencies, whether it's customs, immigration, and also perhaps leaving you with that thought as you enjoy the forthcoming cocktails is that whether we are from the public or private sector, whether we are governments, international organizations, uh, airlines, um, airport operators, 
we all have a vested interest in safe, secure, and seamless travel. And we must work intelligently together to deliver on that promise. Thank you very much. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vijay. Oh, a wonderful hand for Vijay as well. Yes. We are just a few minutes away from the reception, and without further ado, I'd like to call upon our presenter. He is Emmanuel Wong. He is the Vice President Border Control at IDEMIA, who is kindly offering us a wonderful reception. So, Emmanuel. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you uh, to IKO for allowing us to sponsor this uh, uh, today's uh, reception. So I'm uh, Emmanuel Wong uh, from IDEMIA. I guess most of you in the room uh, probably already know IDEMIA, although we had a bit of a change of identity and name in the last years. Um, so I don't know if this works. Yeah, it does work. So you probably know that we are a, one of the leading provider of um, identity solutions to governments, so including, of course, the um, biometric passports. Uh, but oh, thank you. Uh, we also provide end-to-end -end border control solutions to those same governments, and uh, lately we now aim at facilitating passenger journey um, for airports and airlines. So as a short illustration of what we do in this field, I'd like to show a very short video that we have just released um, about Shanghai airports in Singapore. Does that work? Aha. Uh -huh. No. Back. It's before. Yeah, it was before, yeah. Ah. Uh, technology. <laughs> Doesn't work. Really? It's not the same software that they can use. Yeah, okay, sorry uh, for the uh, fake teaser. I'm really uh, disappointed. Um, yeah, <laughs> we'll discuss with the IKO people here. <laughs> so actually, um, well, you can go to our booth and we'll show you the video. I'm sorry about that technical issue. So um, what you might see in the video, if you come to a booth then, uh, it's that um, in Singapore we actually uh, use biometrics technology at each step of the uh, passenger journey in the airport. So step check-in, backdrop, security access, uh, immigration ga uh, gates, and self-boarding. Or you want to try it? Sorry for that. <laughs> yeah, I'll carry on while uh, te technicians try to uh, solve this. Um, but without the slides, then do I need to choose. Yeah, <laughs> I'm really sorry, people, about that. And I, I know I'm uh, sitting between you and, and the drinks. I want it to be short and quick. Yeah, okay, then can you just put the slides back even without the video then?
No one based in Paris. Maybe Simon wants to tell us, to tell us more about your daughters in between, no? I'm just really looking forward to the video. Oh, <laughs> don't want to put your expectations too high now. I mean, think about it. In the video, you're supposed to see uh, that we're using biometrics technology all along the journey of the passenger. And actually, uh, we are quite proud that Singapore has chosen us, Sidemia, to uh, help them lead the uh, what we believe is one of the first implementations um, of this smart border, smart airport concept, uh, really in large scale and fully operational. Of course, there are many international organizations. So obviously including ICAO with the TRIP uh, border control management guides, but also um, IATA with the One ID uh, concept, for instance, that most of you already know, that kind of um, promote the same kind of thing. I'm thrilled to, say, to see that many governments probably here are legislating, regulating, and uh, um, uh, experimenting and, and launching more and more trials that more or less go along the same lines of trying to uh, uh, use biometrics technology to uh, uh, at the same time facilitate travel while securing uh, our borders. Uh, we however believe that this is just the beginning. Um, we can do much more and go further with all the ingredients uh, that are already there but so quickly uh, just before we have our drink uh, we'd like to give a bit of insight on what can happen next, what we believe uh, can be seen as a holistic approach to border management and what we promote to governments. So, I'll try to be quick because we lost lots of time here. Uh, so first, of course, we want to uh, promote the use of advanced passenger information, but also passenger name records um, in advance of the uh, departure of people. Uh, Obviously, also make the most of digital interactions with those travelers ahead of departure, so with the interactive advanced passenger information, but also e-visa electronic travel uh, authorization. Um, the does it? Yeah. Mm, shall I put it in the end? Yeah, I'll put, no, no, okay. Not in chart here. <laughs> But thank you guys anyway because yeah. We have another option that you do the full thing tomorrow after we make sure that No, I can finish. I can finish. I mean. It's a foolish maybe because we can probably show the video again tomorrow if you want. Oh. <laughs> We'd be happy to do it again tomorrow. As you wish. As you wish, but you can give them two minutes to finish. Do you, you think it does? Yes, it, it was working this morning.
No signal again? Hmm. I was saying. So, using interactive uh, uh, advanced passenger information and also uh, uh, other digital inter interactions ahead of travel with visa, e visa, electronic travel authorization, and of course, move uh, um, to a, a more risk based approach to. Um, uh, to border control, uh, targeting suspicious behaviors and facilitating non bona fide travelers instead of sometimes what is more look more like uh, systematically checking the compliance to a list of predefinite criteria, such as do the traveler have a travel document, does he need a visa, um, is he watchlisted, and to do so, use new tools available with artificial intelligence, deep learning, big data technology, all technology that is out there. Now, also move away from the current tr transaction-based approach where the same questions are asked at each border crossing to a more person-centric approach uh, where the government actually sees a continuity between each encounter with travelers, uh, with the entry-exit systems and so on. Uh, and eventually when people arrive at the border, biometrically identify people even if they have multiple union passports with the same picture, but maybe varying biometrics, as was discussed previously. And then, at when you've done that at first encounter, probably try to use maybe face derived from the first declared identity to expedite subsequent border crossings. Doing that, you might even want to e even do it with the passport altogether or even with systematic uh, physical border control. Um, of course, use more and more automation and self-service application to uh, focus border guards on more value-added work and at last empower the traveler um, so that he may choose to give away a bit of his privacy and share the data he, he wishes uh, with governments, even maybe with some commercial agencies in exchange of more convenience when traveling. So all this, uh, although it was a bit uh, discontinuated, uh, we call that it IDEMIA, a, the Augmented Identity at Borders concept, which fairly simple, it consists of growing virtual borders where we use the wealth of information that you have at hand on travelers to uh, do your analysis and then you keep very thin physical borders um, focused on risky individuals only and uh, using biometrics technology to bridge the gap between this physical world and the uh, digital world where you have performed your analysis. So if you want to know more about this concept of um, augmented identity, uh, you can meet us in our booth, um, obviously with a drink in your hand now. Thank you. And thank you for the tech guys for having tried the best. <laughs>
Merci. Merci beaucoup. Well, thank you very much, Emmanuel. As they say, you got more airtime. <laughs> we'll certainly never forget this presentation. No, it's very good. And we will go back to the, the booth and look at the video again. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. Well, we've come to the end of the first day of, second day of our symposium. I will not be between you and the reception, so we'll let you go right away. Be sure to be back here at 9 tomorrow, and it is 9 tomorrow, not 8.30 or 9.30. It is 9 tomorrow. Thank you so much for your attention, cooperation. Again, thanks to our speakers today. Enjoy the evening. See you tomorrow.